Good afternoon, everybody. Today, is, it's, this is not so much a press conference as it is just a panel discussion to look at some of the problems that festivals across the world uh, have to encounter. All our festivals today are placed in a very political position of being platforms for all kinds of conversations and discussions. So we've got together a whole group of festival directors. We had our first major panel uh, yesterday where we had 40 festival directors from India and abroad talking about their specific problems. What we are going to explore today in many ways is how platforms like this are important. What are the kind of challenges that we face uh, in different festivals in different parts of the world? And how, what are the possible solutions to be able to help festivals continue their fight to appropriate that space that we seem to be losing slowly. So I'm going to just start for opening remarks by maybe Namita in terms of some of the issues that we have been confronted with over the last few years. And then I will ask my panelists to say a few words each. And then we will have a quick round of conversations. And I'll ask you all if you have any questions to ask. Namita. Uh, all of you here have watched us grapple with so many problems. Uh, I would say uh, our biggest challenges, uh, not issues, but challenges, is the enthusiasm of the audiences and a lack of uh, that much finance, that much support for the kind of infrastructure that the lovers of Jaipur demand in terms of their audience participation. For me, one of the biggest uh, the, the thing I really want to do in the Jaipur Literature Festival is bring the Indian languages together. But it's very difficult to program them because today we have Manoranjan Vyopari speaking, we have some Tamil writers speaking, and uh, India, across the country people don't understand those. I think this is a um, problem uh, European countries, many other countries face, but they have something like simultaneous translation available to them. So it becomes a much easier challenge. Omar, I'm going to start with you because you've just recently taken over the Palestinian Literature Festival. And if you tell us some of the struggles and difficulties that you've had in this taking over and what's the festival faced before that, I think it'll be very interesting to set the stage. Right. OK, yeah. Well. So the Palestine Festival of Literature, the challenges that the, we face as a festival are very much to do with the challenges that, that Israel imposes on the lives and the movement and the freedoms of Palestinians in general. So what we try and do with the festival is, um, is to create a festival that responds to that. So essentially, it's a moving festival, um, and it travels to its audiences every night because a Palestinian in Ramallah cannot attend an event in Jerusalem. They're not allowed to the wall separates the two cities from each other. Or a Palestinian in Nablus cannot easily get to Bethlehem because, again, the West Bank is severed by settlement structures that stretch down into the, into the sort of territory of the West Bank. So we're, we're a traveling festival. Um, and that's, and, but we're traveling through a military occupation. And we're traveling through military checkpoints. We're traveling. Um, against basically the kind of the structure that, that, that Israeli apartheid is looking to erect over the land. Uh, and that is incredibly challenging, and it's also very challenging in that we never know exactly what we will or will not be able to do, like whether I'll even be allowed into the country, for example, the Israelis control the border in. I mean, for one of the most difficult things that you have to face with is security, both for your authors as well as people traveling to the festival. How do you manage that, and how do you sort of, how do you assure writers and speakers that you're going to be looking after them? Yeah, I mean, I think we've had a good track record. You know, we've been going 10 years now. So I think now authors know that they'll come with us and they'll be looked after and we're not going to take any sort of crazy risks with them. Um, but of course, like, it's not, you know, you're not going into an active war zone, right? This is a, this is a long, enduring, grinding occupation where there is some semblance of sort of day-to-day -day life and there is definitely normality and cultural life going on. and it's set against the sort of ongoing inch by inch colonization of the land, but you're not going into necessarily active danger all the time. There are things that can flare up, things that can 
and every year there are different hotspots and different areas that you know could flare up at any one moment but we tend to know how to navigate them yeah Sherilyn, he says he, they tend to know how to navigate the problem. You're from the Bay Area, Berkeley yes. Bay Area Book Festival. Yes. Berkeley is one of the big strongholds of the liberal movement. Yes. And in recent times, you all have faced a lot of unrest mm -hmm. when you've invited speakers from the right to come. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Berkeley, it resulted in uh, the people, uh, a part of the university was having to step down. What's the kind of issues that you face uh, in terms of keeping a platform a democratic and accessible to all points of view, except a particular point of view. Except for a particular, I mean, ex I, I, except for a conservative point yes. of view. Yeah, well, we have no problem with the liberal point of view in Berkeley. Um, uh, we have a highly diverse festival, uh, lots of people of color, lots of issues like immigration and refugee rights and things like that that we explore. Um, I definitely get pushback from the community um, levels of my own staff to our audience members um, there are security issues that affect the city the city of berkeley is our host so we use the downtown area and um, if there are speakers who may cause uh, a lot of dissent there's concern about security and as a festival we only have a limited budget so i do have to look at speakers in terms of what the impact would be on our budget and I don't like being in that situation I firmly believe that we should be want to be a festival that presents a wide variety of viewpoints I've admired JLF from the beginning because of how it actively does this um, and I think that's a role as a literary festival in the world today to bring together people who have really thought through their positions and put them on paper and to be able to then appear in person and speak those ideas and interact with the audience um, and in conversation with someone of a different perspective is an incredibly valuable service to society. So the Bay Area Book Festival in Berkeley, we have that intention, we're getting there, and we're facing, ironically, some censorship slightly from the left. Thank you. Anupama, recently Mami, which is the festival that you uh, head up, ran into some issues, and I remember in our panel in Bombay at the Opera House, one of the filmmakers, uh, Shazia, uh, said that she, being a Muslim, had made a film on Muslim misogyny called Bebak. And because one of the people in the producing, in the producing company uh, of Phantom Films had been named in the Me Too movement, uh, the festival then disallowed her film to be shown. And she said, the Me Too movement has become a religion. And why was my film not allowed? Love you to just talk to us a little bit because this is some of the issues that we grappled even in the round table where we talked about do we need to separate the art from the artist? Uh, how do we deal? Is there a protocol that we have to now deal with this issue? If you tell us how you came to the conclusion and what's the kind of protocol today? We've, I know we've circulated under FICI a new protocol for all festivals to follow. But tell us some of the challenges. Yeah, for us, it was um, it was a big struggle. We didn't arrive at that decision easily because uh, a film, more than any other art, is a collaborative process. And and you know you can't um, when when you say that this film can't be allowed, there are hundreds of people who worked on it. And for us, it was just that we came in. Uh, so the Me Too movement hit us right at the beginning. And honestly, the truth is, I still don't know that we made the right decision. But at that point, it was very important for us to make a very strong statement that there will be zero tolerance. Um, and we really struggled with it. Uh, we, we had a board meeting, several board meetings. We, um, you know, and we did not have the luxury to have a nuanced response at that time. I wish we had. Um, and I apologized at the opening ceremony to everyone we hurt and everyone we disappointed. Uh, but I just felt that at that time, for us to say that this is OK, but this is not okay and take that name off and it'll be okay. Um, I feel like now we maybe have not taken that decision, but at that time it was the only right thing to do. Anupama, because you guys are in the forefront, you know, literature festivals like this reach uh, half a million people on the ground, another million people uh, are online, which is our uh, audience. Somebody like you, films, which are just so incredibly powerful, what do you need to do to fight to ensure that all kinds of films are allowed the same kinds of platforms? 
and it's for the audiences finally to make up their mind whether they should see, not see, ban, not ban. I mean, how do you see that and how do you see that fight for that space? You know, the, the reason I think uh, we put the kind of love and passion and work into Mami as we have is because we need a space for all kinds of film. Um, and the truth is that, that uh, there isn't that space. Uh, all films that you see in theatres in this country are censored. And film festivals are... Are certified. Are certified. Sorry. <laughs> are certified. Um, so I think with film festivals, you have an opportunity to see films that otherwise would not even get distribution here. Because there's just not enough of a market. Or the gatekeepers think there isn't enough of a market. At Mami, we have hundreds of people sort of lining up for two, three, four hours to see these films. But the shoplifters won't come here. Uh, you know, many of these films uh, will never be released here. So for us, it's very important to keep this space alive and running and passionate. Because I really think that we are also um, nurturing the next generation of filmmakers when they see these movies that they can't see on a big screen at least anywhere and uh, yes we all love netflix but there is something about that big screen that is still very very valuable david you come from a country very much like um, south asia where there's been a huge um, partition in ireland on religious lines which is far more dramatic very much as it was in india how with your festival which is an economic festival how have you sort of been able to bridge that particular divide and been able to address some of the issues of building bridges between two, two communities, two religions, and now two countries. Well, uh, Sanjay, thank you. I'm from Ireland, uh, if you didn't get that description. Uh, the, the way you deal with Protestants uh, is you marry them, so I married one, right? <laughs> and uh, that's the, the best thing about Protestants, you should sleep with Protestants, and then you get to know them very well, and they're not that different to the rest of us. Uh, but Shan, actually, my wife, puts on the bigger festival that we do in Dorky, and we have to disguise her Protestant nature uh, when she comes in, because clearly that would set the cat amongst the pigeons. No, seriously, our... But does, is that an issue? Is it an is issue? identity in that kind of issue? If it were in Belfast, a hundred miles up the road from Dublin, it is a huge issue. So, for example, I just did a recent book launch, my own book, in Belfast in early early December and the audience was a big big audience close to a thousand people I would say there were about five Protestants in the room because it was in West Belfast it was organized uh, as a thing called fail in the Pubble, which means a celebration of the community in Irish and the Irish language uh, very closely aligned to the politics of West Belfast which are nationalist um, and interestingly, at the book signing afterwards, lots of people were chatting, were chatting, chatting, the people were chatting in Irish and in English, which is also a giveaway. And a guy came up to me, and he was quite sheepish, and uh, he said, uh, I'd like you to sign my book. I saw your book. I said, fine, okay. He said, I'm actually the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, but I can't say that too loudly around here. So it is an issue in Belfast, whereas in Dublin, it's not an issue at all. Um, what is an issue is sometimes when we have political debates, both at Dorky and Kilconomics, we use comedians to actually impale some of the more serious political commentators, because comedians are a beautifully subversive species in every society and even if you go back i was listening to uh simon sebag montefiore about the romanovs just there the only guy who was actually safe in the court of the czars was the fool because the fool can say things and can be deployed and has been deployed for centuries and we deploy comedians all the time in our festivals to sort of circumvent uh, issues uh, but finally what is interesting uh, and it's very interesting about the Palestinian festival is that what we found in Ireland, Ireland is an overwhelmingly pro-Palestinian country. Almost, it's a, almost a mark of uh, of national. Uh, it's about heritage and legacy and all this. So we found that, for example, Israeli writers get a very hard time in Ireland 
uh, Amos Oz, who just passed away, possibly one of the finest writers uh, that I've read, and, and um, came to Dalkey four or five years ago, and it was interesting. So the difficulty there, the actual political difficulty, was from pro-Palestinian groups against Israeli writers, and that's you know it's a, it's one that we can all I don't know how to navigate it perfectly, but it's it's certainly an issue. So every country has its idiosyncrasy, and ours I think is the uh, pro-Palestinian stance, which is, in my opinion is justified, but it should never I believe silence Israeli writers or artists. Thank you. Um, navigate is again a word that you use, Jaya You know when you used to do the. Uh, Bangalore Times, Lit uh, Times Literature Festival, you had to na navigate a lot of issues and at some point of time you decided, let me do my own festival. Will you, can you share, if I'm not putting you on a spot, well, some of the conundrum that you were in and how you were able to navigate or not navigate uh, that? So I, I used to run the Times Literary Festival for two years and the I am aspirational about running a festival in the future. It's very much in planning stage. So the problems of the festival are, I think that there are two festivals in Bangalore, and both seem to be going in the same direction of being very commercial in tone. So, you know, the big writers. And I think that, um, you know, writers who are less famous, writers who are doing interesting work, perhaps, not best-selling is the kind of writer I would like to give voice to in a literary festival. Because there is something exciting about going and listening to someone and discovering that person through his work or her work and not through press. So that was definitely something that I took away that it, it should be curated in a different way so that the festivals each have their own identity. The second problem is that of funding. And when you have funding and you have to actually pander to so many sponsors, it's not one sponsor or two sponsors, it becomes a little compromising for the writer. And in my day job, as you know, I'm an agent and I found it, you know, like a lot of my writers did me favors by, uh, you know, allowing, by holding up products and by saying things about their products, which I would never dream of doing if I was just curating a literary festival for itself. And the third thing is you have to be, you know, you brought it up, the whole thing of language and the language that is spoken in Karnataka is Kannada, and they, they really prefer that their sessions are separate from the English language ones. They don't, I, I wanted it to be inclusive, and I said, okay, Kannada novelist, uh, Turkish novelist, Chinese novelist, let's talk about the universality of storytelling. But that is not something that goes down well. The Kannada writers still want their own poetry, prose, nonfiction, everything separate. So it's like curating two different festivals. And the third, the last thing is politically, you always have to be sensitive about the Tamil, the Tamil Kannada uh, sort of divide. And you know, when, when it gets difficult and when it's sort of electric, you pay heed to it. And you know, I would want my writers to be safe. Thank you, Jack. I'm going to come back, Namita, to you for a second. You know, she talked about language being a big issue. And we know that here at, at Jaipur, Many people in the initial years, and I, I, I keep hearing some whatever as to why don't you give more space for Indian language writing? And then I say to them, why don't you look at the program and count the number of sessions? And you are the people, especially within the press, who actually only focus obviously on the Jeffrey Archers of the world, but why don't you also focus on the Manoranjan Vyaparis of the world? And if you look at that in terms of the Rajasthani writing, uh, as we know, there's a festival that's been set up as a parallel festival, but they set it up as, because we hate Jaipur Literature Festival, so we set it up. But we know that we are very happy to be supportive. So how do we sort of marry that? Uh, first of all, I don't think that the parallel festival this year is uh, in a competitive spirit. I think those writers to whom we cannot give so much voice here, I'm very happy that they are finding an extra platform. And I'm glad that they're also realizing that there is absolutely no conflict of interest. But it's always this hierarchy of languages, because English is the language in which, unfortunately, we all communicate. Uh, whether it is Norla or whether it is Ireland or French, this language has, by some accident of colonial imperialism, become a uh, uh, common language. Uh, 
I care passionately for Hindi, I care passionately for the other Indian languages, but Hindi is easy. Because Hindi is very good for Hindi and for their audiences. But the Tamil, as I said, Bengali you get everywhere. Uriya, we have large Uriya audiences here. But Tamil audiences, Kannad audiences, the writers are great, but we cannot... So we have a system of simultaneous translation, which is a bit awkward, but today Manoranjan Vyapari is on a session. I just... Uh, somebody is going to translate from Hindi, from Bengali. So we, we improvise, we do a very big jugaad. And in that jugaad we manage. It's a language jugaad. What to do? We have, we have uh, 14 Indian languages this year and almost every Indian language has been covered over the last 12 years. Only one language remains, which is Bodo. And Bodo remains simply because there are only two or three very good writers in Bodo and uh, one of them was not available and things. Uh, Rajasthani, we have a session with uh, C.P. Devan about why Rajasthani is not a national language. Because that has to be interrogated also because if our karma is in Rajasthan, then we should get the most important place to get the most important place to get the But this is everywhere. Kashmir, we, we play up a lot on Kashmiri because the Kashmiri language has been well suppressed by Urdu, which is a foreign language there. So this uh, hegemony of different languages, uh, we had a session once called Hindi Angrezi Bhai Bhai. Because Hindi and Angrezi are the same So it's a, we have to balance, we create harmony and we try to believe in the old saying, many languages, one literature. That is what the Jaipur Literature Festival believes, that in Indian languages, we have many languages but one literature. Emmanuel, you come in a sense from the safest space, which is in France at St. Marlo, which is one of the most beautiful festivals that you've done. But yet, you do have challenges, and if you can tell us a few of the challenges that you, as the festival director, have sort of encountered there in this beautiful neck of the woods. Yeah, well, very safe space where, well, uh, in France, unfortunately, we did have a problem with terrorism, you see, and, and, and so on. So, so we try to maintain uh, the best security in our festival. The challenges, yes, yes, we have. Uh, we have financing changes because uh, funding a festival is always a problem. So we do rely on uh, local authorities, which means uh, the city, the city of saint Malo in Brittany, west of France, uh, which uh, has been welcoming the festival for nearly 30 years now, yeah? The department, uh, the region, also the national authorities, the Ministry of Culture, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but all those authorities uh, uh, have also to have also financing problems. So each year it's a big challenge to because, well, uh, the success of the festival is equal from ever to from a year to another. So we uh, roughly welcome, uh, well, compared to Jaipur, it's just nothing but we welcome between 60 and 70 thousand people in three days. Uh, in Saint-Malo. So we have to imagine, you have to invent, you have to, to search, you see the private sponsors, you see the money. So this is a, really a challenge. Uh, another challenge is, well, uh, French is an important language, uh, but, uh, well, it was also a colonial language. And we have a lot of uh, links, of course, with ex countries where, where France were the, were the, were the rulers. Had the power, yes. And so uh, it's always a challenge, you see, to, to give a voice, to give a space to writers, you see, of those countries who want to publish. And it's also a challenge to leave the, uh, the uh, publishers of those countries, you see, to work, because when there's a, a very good young uh, African writer from the West Africa, for instance, from one country of the West Africa, you have a French publisher, you see, jumped on him, you see, and, uh, and then he published. But it would be 
much smarter to live a local publisher to publish and you see and maybe make a, a co edition see, of the book. So it's also perhaps a challenge because we, uh, it's impossible you see, to leave uh, the publishing world of those countries you see uh, inactive. And uh, what else? What are the other challenges that we face? Let, let me go to uh, 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 Oliver at this point in time. Oliver, Norla is such an incredibly important organization. This is as a policy of of the state of the of, of your government you look at how to support writing and translation yes. not just in your country but really across the world mm -hmm. and as state policy can you tell us a little bit about how you drive this narrative and how this very time from our perspective a very tiny country in a very cold part of the world very far away is able to influence uh, writing and culture now mostly in so many different parts of the world and a little bit about the politics around that influencing well um it's i think it's a small and cold country in all uh, from all perspectives uh so we, i think in one way we face a bit the same the challenges as some indian languages that it's a small language we have five and a half million people and and how do you make yourself heard how do you how do you how do you protect and preserve such a small language so the norwegian state actually started in the 19 early 60s to support uh, literature by letting the state buy uh, a thousand copies of norwegian novels of a certain quality and distribute them to the libraries in addition to what the libraries buy themselves and this system has been uh, going on until this very day and this secures the, the writers to write and the publishers that they can publish uh, and then what we do is my organization Norla is to promote uh, Norwegian literature abroad and support translation and support writers when you invite uh, writers here to JLF we can support their travel and it's the same to kind of make the literature uh, read abroad and to make to make it possible that it travels and it's a, it's a way of preserving our language and our culture and to give it a position in the world. Well, thank you all very much for sharing your ideas. I'm going to quickly open it up and if there are any questions from anybody in the press, we are happy to. And if you can also say who it's addressed to. My question is addressed to Namita Ji. I'm Srinivas coming from Delhi Prabhat, Pune, Maharashtra. So maybe that's mother tongue. Uh, you spoke about financing and uh, everything. M many of the uh, panelists also said that is uh, these days becoming difficult to manage. I am just curious about complete the budgeting, financing, and turnover of the ZLF. I, I didn't bring up that subject. My <laughs> okay. department is only okay. to program. Okay. I curate the programming, okay. the money, yeah. profit and loss. No, 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 I'm not talking about profit but and loss. No, I'll answer, I'll yeah, answer yes, the question. Yes, he will please. answer, yeah, yeah, I'll answer thank the question. You. So, uh, basically when it comes, the, the total budget of the festival, both cash and kind, is about 20 crores, roughly. And the total revenue every year sort of balances, sometimes we lose money, sometimes we make money. But if you do cost to company, then there's no way a festival like this, because as you know, we take very little money from government, unlike many of the festivals in Europe. All our money comes primarily from sponsorship, and we are trying to move to a situation where only 50% of our money comes from sponsorship, 50% comes from gate receipts, khana pina, everything that you see around you, and we're able to make it. What a lot of people don't realize is that every time even one person walks through the door, the badge, the laminate, the chair, the program, the bag, everything costs us money, so it's like a newspaper. The more newspapers you sell, the, le the more money you lose. So we're trying to create a balance at some point of time. We haven't been successful, but hopefully we will be. Namita ji, one thing you wanted to ask about the crisis you have told, the crisis is with Sahit Academy and all the national organizations who is dealing with literature. Most of the writers doesn't speak English while they are very good in Telugu, Kannada, Tamil, even in uh, Hindi also, Rajasthani. So, how do you accommodate it? Because Sanjay will tell you, is there a festival in Iran in Iran? Is there a literature in Iran? 
यदि ईरान में है तो मैं ईरान दो बार गया हूँ फिल्म फेस्टिवल में लेकिन ईरान में फारसी के अलावा एक शब्द सुनाई नहीं देता कहीं भी तो वो इतने गुड इंटरप्रेटर ईरान में इतने द फाइनेस्ट इंटरप्रेटर दे आर है तो समझ गए हम तो मैंने जवाब दिया था आपको और हम जुगाड़ करते हैं कि या हिंदी या अंग्रेजी का कोई लेखक हो जो उन भाषाओं में भी शामिल हो जैसे आज अभी एक सेशन हो रहा है उसमें सल दो लोग हैं जिनको अंग्रेजी नहीं आती है इट्स अ सेशन कॉल द अदर उसमें फारो आनंद है वो अंग्रेजी में लिखती हैं और नहीं तो सलमा हैं जो खाली तमिल बोलती हैं और मनोरंजन व्यापारी हैं जो बंगाली बोलते हैं और थोड़ी सी हिंदी बोलते हैं तो थोड़ी सी हिंदी के लिए और बंगाली के लिए मीनाक्षी ठाकुर उनके साथ बैठी हैं और वो ज़रा वो भी बात करेंगी और सलमा से बात करने को मानसी सुब्रमण्यम बैठी हैं जो वो तमिल में भी बात करेंगी पर हम हर सवाल को ट्रांसलेट नहीं करते हैं जो मोटी मोटी बातें होती हैं हम समझते हैं ऑडियंस समझ जाएगी और उनको भी इनक्रेज करते हैं कि ज़रा आप अंग्रेजी हिंदी में भी बोलिए जो छोटे वाक्य हैं जो चीज स्पष्ट हो सकती टूटा फूटा है कोई बात नहीं जैसे कि संजय रॉय की हिंदी थी आप लोगों ने इनकी हिंदी वेरी गुड दिस डे सो मैं उर्दू एनी अदर क्वेश्चन हेलो सर हेलो सर अ वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल ऑफ यू माय क्वेश्चन इज एड्रेस टू मिस्टर ओमर वेलकम टू इंडिया सर वी ऑल नो दैट पैलेस्टीनियन फेस्टिवल ऑफ एथ्रेचा इज बिकमिंग वेल नोन ऑल अराउंड दी वर्ल्ड सो इन द रीसेंट इयर्स व्हाट सॉर्ट ऑफ चेंजेस हैव टेकन प्लेस टू कीप दी कल्चर अलाइव आई थिंक विद आवर फेस्टिवल वी आर वेरी एंगेज विद द डिस्कोर्स अराउंड पैलेस्टाइन and one of the things that the festival was established to do was to have a role within the representation of palestine in the wider world um and so we would bring writers and artists who we thought would respond to what they were seeing and then would return to wherever they were from and 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 kind of feed back into the culture that they came from and a fundamental thing has changed in the 10 years that we've been operating in that in 2008 the role of the writer as a witness was still kind of one of the primary roles of the writer in the world but our feeling is now in the age of social media and the internet that particular act of witnessing has sort of become so diversified and so spread among us all that what we are trying to do to keep ourselves sort of fresh as a festival is to now take another step forward and think of the writer as not just a witness but as the kind of creator of new ideas and new discourses and so it's not about we can all now go online and see very easily what sort of visually palestine looks like or watch an attack or watch the israeli army incurs making an incursion or killing someone or shooting someone like we can all do that very easily but what we as a festival want to do is to help us all the wider picture about what is being done to palestine and about the role of all of our countries and all of our cultures in keeping that injustice going and how ultimately the perpetuation of the colonization of palestine and the continuation of an apartheid regime in 2019 how that ultimately has an effect on the whole world um and that's what our role is and that's what we hope to sort of bring writers that can kind of think about that in new and you know artistic ways hello my question is to everybody and anybody you can answer there is this thing there's this archetype of a starving artist you know normally we say that the art you know there's no wealth involved here so obviously you guys in the festival give exposure but what happens to the progress of the artist does the festival help in you know help in prog- uh, the artist progressing maybe making money maybe making a living because you call artists from all over the your you know from the remotest corners of the country so how do you help in there i think it's a it's a really interesting question and it's one i think everybody who organizes any meeting whether it is a glamorous festival or even a small little book launch is consistently asking what are we in the business of and i i think that certainly in the case of what we do in Ar- ireland giving writers artists a platform is enormously important for their career because 
it gives people another voice, another way of telling their story, another way of interpreting other people's stories. I, I wouldn't be too outrageously congratulatory about it, but I do think that festivals make a huge difference to writers' careers because fans come. If you think about writing a book, it's a very solitary idea. You sit, I do it myself, you sit for hours on end on your own, writing, rewriting. You've no idea if anybody's going to read this, okay? And you've no real relationship with your audience when they go and buy the book. And then you come to a festival and you have real live readers. And it's an amazingly positive experience for writers to meet readers, for readers to say, look, I read that, it was really interesting, or I didn't like that, it was terrible, but that engagement. So I wouldn't underestimate the monastic sense of the writer. And when they're taken out of their own monastery and delivered to the people and facilitated, particularly at something like, like Jaipur, it's really impressive and I think it's really important. And also just to say that not all, all artists are uh, starving. exactly starving. If you see Jeffrey Archer down there right now, <laughs> I wouldn't quite say that as a starving artist, but we have many examples of how uh, young yeah. people have, have actually so, been able to benefit. And Namit, I'll you know, give you an I just example. want to say that the Jeffrey Literature Festival in the last 12 years has been an incredible source of support and a catalyst to many, many writers. The number of people who have met agents and publishers on the lawns here and have gone on in their careers and remember it and are part of our festival for that reason. We also have the Jaipur Bookmark where we actively incubate and support talent. But uh, I'd say the biggest um, pr plus point of these festivals is off time when people are sitting in a bus, when they are having a drink together, when they're just standing in a queue. Uh, to go to the washroom. They exchange ideas and they learn so much and we have created a community of writers who learn from each other. And we also have something called iWrite where you can uh, send in your submissions, those are shortlisted and you can do a pitch to publishers and to filmmakers etc. So that's a separate And thing. two books have come out of that this year itself. That's wonderful. And I think, in, at least in Noah, we see a bit the same with, in the book industry as in as what has happened earlier in the music industry. That music sales have gone down, but musicians' concerts are getting more and more important. And it's the same with, with, uh, with writers, that one is worried about the book sales, but uh, people are so interested in going to, to um, meetings with writers. There are literature houses in all major cities. People come to these meetings where they can meet the, the author in person. So I think that the, the personal meeting actually gets more and more important in these digital times. And that is, uh, that is very important. And it, of course, it gives a lot back to the authors. And, and then on the, other, the international travels for the authors, to, to come here to experience JLF, to experience India, is so rewarding and so developing for, for the people coming here, for the authors coming here. Any last question before we wrap up? Or will be happy to wrap up. So thank you all very much. Thank you, wonderful panelists and festival directors, for doing well, what we all do in, in many different ways is just protect that space for writing, for literature, for thoughts and ideas, and safe journey on your way back. And on behalf of all of us here at the festival, thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.